Thank you very much. So, hello everyone. I hope everybody can see me. Thank you very much for coming today. I'm very excited to be speaking here. Great. Uh, my name is Dor Sever. I'm a software developer at Big Panda. Uh, before we start, I would kindly ask you to keep your questions to the end of the talk, please. We've got a lot of content to go over today. And let's start. So we're going to talk today about killing the unit test. And let's start with a question. Who here ever deployed a back to production because they forgot to write a test? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Great. So this happened to me too. And it's really, really annoying, right? It seems like a problem that it's impossible to solve. I call this the missing unit test problem. No matter how much time or how much effort we put into our tests, we are going to be missing tests. So we really need a way to solve this problem. And that's what we're going to do today. Today we're going to solve the missing unit test problem. How are we going to do that? We're going to be using property-based testing. So we're going to tackle a real feature we've done here at Big Panda not so long ago, and to write some code and then write some tests and try to push it on and on until we feel the problem has resolved. So let's start with a little story. Imagine a room filled of NASA people, and all those people are looking at, at their screens. And in those screens, um, they are seeing the following UI. They are seeing three folders. So those people are monitoring their production environment. Imagine they're launching a, a missile into space, so stuff go wrong and somebody needs to fix it. So those people are sitting in front of the their screens and this is what they are seeing. They are seeing three folders. They are seeing an active folder, a shared folder, and a an resolved folder. The count in all of these folders at the moment is zero. So the guys look at the screen and have nothing to do. They continue to scroll in Facebook. Life is good. Then an alert comes in. Let's imagine we've got some high CPU in one of our Elastic servers. And that alert is going to enter two folders. It's going to enter the active folder, and it's going to enter the shared folder. Then what happens? The folder counters will be incremented into one, and the guys will see, wait, I've got a count of one. Let's click on the folder and start resolving the, the issues. So that's the story. And the job we are going to do today, this is a real job we've done here in Big Panda, is to implement the counters logic for those folders. Great, so let's look at our, how our data looks like. So we've got a folder, this is, this is our sum type, a folder, which we have three objects extending it. The active folder, the shared folder, and the results folder. This is how the, the code looks like. Nothing fancy here. And this is how the alert looks like, right? We have some data. So we model it using two properties. A string, which indicates what the alert information, for example, high CPU in one of our Elastic servers. And a set of folders, which basically say, in which folders does this alert sit at? In our example, it's going to be an active and a shared set. Great, so here are our requirements. We are going to be need, needing to add alerts to the current folder counters. We're going to need to support that. We are going to need to support a way to remove alerts from the folder counters. And we're going to be needing direct access to a folder's count. So we think of all the requirements, we think of all our data, and begin designing our API. And our API looks like this. So First thing, we define a type alias called counters, which is just a mapping of folders to int, because we need to save for every folder its count. Great. And then we define the counters API, the real logic. And we define it using two functions, the add to counters functions and the remove from counters. Both take a current counters and an alert and return the updated counters. So this is the story, this is the code. Let's write some test, right? So this is the specification. We have empty counters, an alert comes in, and the counters should be incremented into one. That's the story. So here are some imports. 
that we're going to use. A lot of Scala test imports are going to appear in this talk today. And we begin writing tests. So let's look at what we've got here. We are defining two groups of tests. We have two functions, so two groups of tests, and we're writing give or take three or four tests per function. So we've got tests like increment the active count by one when an active alert comes in, exactly like the specification. Alerts comes in, the count should be incremented. And we're checking that all of the folders behave the way we want. So we can increment all of the folders. So we do the same test for active, for shared, resolved, and we do the opposite test for the remove function. So far, really straightforward. And let's see how one of these tests is implemented. So this is the add an active alert and make sure the active count is incremented by one test. So we define an empty counters. Remember, this was the specification. And then we create an active alert, add it to the empty counters, and make sure the count is active and one. Great, so what do we do now? We copy paste exactly the same unit test seven times and for all the other use cases, for the shared alert, for the resolved alert, for the remove function, basically the same tests. And then we've written, I think, seven or eight unit tests. So what do we do now? We run them, right? We've written eight tests, I think it's pretty much 130 lines of code. This is what we actually wrote. And great, everything is passing. So now what do we do? I think we go home, right? This was a good day of work. We've written a feature, we've written our tests. We go home. I still remember till this day, the very first time my manager called me and said I had a bug in production. I really hated myself at that point. That's a lousy feeling. And this is what happened that day. The boss was calling and he told me I've got a bug in production. He said the counters are stuck at one. No matter what we do, the counters are stuck in one. So let's try and figure out what did we do wrong here. So this was the original bug. So this is another view of the add to counters function. It takes two input, right, and return an output type. So the inputs are counters at the top, alert at the bottom, and return an updated counter. As it turns out, this function always ignored the input counters. No matter what we gave it, somebody forgot to write the code. And why didn't we test it? Why didn't we catch it? We wrote 130 lines of code, 100% code coverage, right? We felt confident in our unit tests, in our code. So this is what we tested. Let's take another look at what we just did. This is the unit test that we wrote. We took a specific counters value. We took a specific alert value, combined them, and got a result. If you think about it, there are a lot of values missing here. Let's take a look. This is the missing unit test problem. If you look at the counters type or at the alert type, we are seeing an infinite amount of values, right? We've got the empty map and the map of active one and the map of active one and shared one and so on and so on. Infinite amount of values and so the same is true for the alert. We chose just a specific value and wrote specific unit test just for that. So how can we address it? We, there, are, uh, there are infinite amount of unit tests that we did not write here. So at this point, I got really, really frustrated. And instead of writing 20 more unit tests, I said, let's change the way we work. So property-based tests allows us to solve exactly this issue in a much more beautiful way. Let's look how. So property-based tests, this is the, the, main, the main focus today. So property-based test works by defining a property. Just a property. A property is a high level specification of behavior. Right? So we've got properties which tell tells us what is the behavior. And those properties should hold for all values of our specific type. So I'm not really understanding anything here. Let's look at some more definitions. Maybe it will help. This is a mathematical definition of 
of what property-based test really is. I'm using the for all syntax. This is a Boolean logic syntax. And I'm saying for all values of our type. And if you run the property on the value, the result should be true. If you take a closer look here, the amount of values that we are talking about are infinite, right? Some of our types have infinite amount of values. So property-based test tells us that for all of these values, the property should return to, it should hold. That's the very definition. Now, I've used a lie today. It's the white lie that everybody is using when they're talking about property-based tests, and is that we are not computers, some of us at least, and we can't really test all values. So how do we handle that? We generate a fixed amount of tests, let's say 100, and we run the property on them. Great, so let's see if we really understood what a property is. This is the hello world property. It says, if you take any list and reverse it twice, you should get the same list back. In a mathematical notation, it is written like this. For all lists of type list, if you reverse it twice, it should equal the original list. So what do you say? Will this property hold? Let's look. What will this return? Will it work? Yeah, right? I think it works. And what about this list, the Fibonacci list? Will it work? Yeah, right? So it looks like we've got a good property on our hands. Great. So let's go to the details. Let's drill down to the mechanics of how property-based test works. So we need to talk about Scala check. Scala check is the library in Scala that we're going to be using when writing properties. That's it. In order to understand property inner mechanism, and in order to actually write them, like we're, going, like we're about to do in the next slide, we need to talk about two things, generators and properties. So this is the de definition of a generator. We've got a polymorphic trait, which takes a single type parameter, A, and defines a single function called the sample. It returns values of that A. That's a generator, straight and simple. So what can we do with this trait? It turns out that quite a lot. We can, for example, define the int generator. What can we do with an int generator? We can say, generate ints for me. We can sample it once and sample it twice and three times and get random int values. So I'm sure you're probably thinking at this point, this could be really, really useful, right? We need to go over an infinite amount of values. How can we do that? It looks like generators are the solution. So let's try to define a generator for the counters type, right? For the map of folder to int. This is what we, we want to do. We want to catch the bug that, we, that, we, that slipped by us. Remember, the manager is calling and we are really, really upset. We want to write some properties that will solve the problem, that will help identify the problem. So let's try and do that. So we've got a lot of code here, nothing to get scared about. Um, we are using the Scala check gen implementation in this code, not the implementation we just defined. Uh, the second thing to notice here is that we don't really need to define the basic types, the generator for the basic types, like we just did for the int. Everything is defined for us, and we can just use it. The third, and I think the most powerful feature of generators, is that they can compose. Meaning, if we've got a generator of folder, like we see here, and a generator of a number, we can compose it together to a generator of folder to counter, which is really, really beautiful. And the rest is just following some types and using some combinators you can read about. Go check out the code. Um, and then, once we've done that, we can sample. We can make sure the, the counters generator really, really works, right? So we sample it once, and we sample it twice, and we see we get random counters. So, great. There is a way for us to run on an infinite amount of values in the counters type. This is what we want to do. So, great. Let's talk about properties now. 
So you're probably asking yourself, are properties just a fancy way of saying assertions, right? I've been using assertions 10 years, 20 years. I've been using assertions a long time now. So what is this property that you're talking about? So yes, properties are just fancy word for an assertion. But it's an assertion with one special requirement. Uh, that requirement is it must hold for all values. Just the assertions that I'm sure everybody here in this room have used before, but they must hold for all values. A normal assertion works on a specific value. This should hold for all values. So I think we're good to go. Let's try to write our first property. So again, a lot of imports. The, the most interesting one at this point is the generator driven property checks trait. I think it's the longest trait I've seen in Scala test, to be honest. And I'm defining some property spec testing trait which, be, which will be useful, but just boilerplate code. And then let's define the first property. So this is how it looks like. The first line says, this is the property name, increment the alert folders. Then we are seeing the for all syntax. So this is the same syntax we've seen at the mathematical notation, remember, the for all mathematical operator, it appears here also. And it basically tells Scala check, we are going to run and create properties here. Great. The second line is telling us what are the inputs that we are going to assert our property at. So here we are saying, please generate random values of counters and alerts for me. Remember the generator that we've defined just four slides ago? We are going to sample some values out of it here and assert the property. What is the property? So at this point we've got counters in one hand and alert in, in the other. And there is nothing else to do at this point besides add to counters function, right? And then when we try to write the property, on what do we assert? So I think this is a real barrier that a lot of people get stuck at. Stuck at. Why? What we really want to do here is to say, take the alert. The alert sits at some folders, right? Take the counters, combine them, and make sure that's the result. Or maybe check that the counters were incremented by one where the alert sits. We are trying to re-implement the add to counters function. We have an infinite amount of values entering here. We can't write any, any hard-coded values. We can't use any constant numbers here. So in order to assert, we need to re-implement the add to counters function. And this happens a lot of times. So how, how can we handle it? Uh, so we take a step back, take a zip of water, and try to do things differently. So how can we define properties? This is the way I do it. I think it's really, really useful. I try to look at my functions from the type level, right? We are functional programmers, so we like types. We have input types, we have output types, and they matter. So I look at all the values of the input types. I look at all the values of the output types. And, I try, and I'm trying to see some pattern. Something should emerge when we are doing this. A really useful trick to find properties that I, found really, that I find really, really useful is to use the empty values of the types. Meaning, let's see what happens when we use an empty alert, like the first value that you see here, or the empty counters. A lot of properties are hiding in the empty values. So I squeezed my eyes really, really hard, really, really hard, squinted them really for a long time, and then a property emerged. I call this the empty alert property. And what does this say? It says the following thing. If you take the empty alert, meaning the alert that sits at no folder, right, and combine it to any counter's value, the result always remains the same. The counter's value never change when I add them to the empty alert. OK, this feels like a very good property. I think I can work with it. It handles all of the inputs, right? I'm not using any constant numbers or values here. So let's try to write it down. This is how we do it. 
So we're defining add the empty alert, add, adding the empty alert to any counters should not change them. This is the property that we, that we are going to use. And we're using the for all syntax, like we have seen before. And we are saying here this, please generate random counters value. Remember the generator that we've defined before? Generate random values, please, for me, and assert the following properties. If you add the empty alert to any counters value in the world, and there is an infinite amount of values entering this, this assertion, the, the, the result should be like the incoming counters. Great, so this feels like a very good, pro a good property, and we run it, right? And what, do, what does ScalaCheck do? So it found us a counter example. We said this property is going to hold for all values of the input types. It told us you're wrong. Why are you wrong? If you take the map active zero at line eight of this code, an assertion will fail. And I'm saying, ah, I did not think about it. Great. So remember the bug that woke, up, woke, us, woke us late at night? I think we found it. And we fix it, right? And now I'm asking myself and I'm asking you, is this a victory? Are we done? Did we write enough tests? Are we sure? So of course not. We're just beginning the talk. Um, we forgot the remove from counters function. Remember, we had two functions, the add to counters and the remove from counters. We've written properties only to the add to counters. As it turns out, the remove from counters has some interesting properties too. For example, if you take the empty alert and remove it from any counters value, the counters remain the same. Great, so we write that property too. And now, what do we do? We've got a new problem in our hands, right? We are missing properties. There are a lot of properties in the world. Unit test, I can find. Unit test, I know how to say I'm missing that unit test and that unit test. I've got a missing properties problem in my hand. I've written two properties. It was really, really hard, at least the first time I've done it. How can I find new properties, right? That's a really difficult question. I'm looking at my API. I think that's basically the, the, the one thing that you, you can do at this point. I'm looking at my counters API. I'm seeing two functions. I've written properties for each and every one of them. What am I missing? So a lot of people answer these kind of questions in the bathroom, like this guy would recommend, with some quality time alone. I, for example, love to answer these questions while I'm running. I've been running for the last 12 or 13 years of my life. I think it's one of the best things I do. It, it, it brings me so much joy. This is a photo of me running in the Tel Aviv Marathon a while ago. And during one of these runs that happened, I think, four months ago, I thought of my API. And I thought, this is what I do. I think about my code while I'm running. And I thought about my API. And I thought about the add to counters and the remove from counters. There are two separate implementations at the moment, right? Are they related? I've got two functions that are implemented in different ways. Maybe they are related. And then it hit me. It took me a long time to understand this. If I take any alert in the world, if I remove it from the counters and then add it, I think the counters value should stay the same. I think the functions are related. So I immediately go to my computer while I'm sweating and write the following code, right? I'm saying, if I remove and add an alert, I should keep the original counters. Great. So we are using the for all syntax, like we've done before. And I'm saying, please generate random counters and random alerts here. And then I'm just calling the functions. I'm saying, if you remove an alert from any counters and then add it back, I think the counter should stay the same. I think it will work. I have no idea at this point, by the way. Unless I'm the counter is zero. What? Unless the counter is zero. Ah, we have a computer here. Good job. Um, the first time I ran it, everything was passing. Okay, great. 
I pushed the code to master, right? I've written some unit tests. It was a really, really good run. I did not think of what you just said at that day. It was really, really hot outside. Good job. I'm, I'm saying, let the computer do the work, right? It, everything looks good. And then I push it to master, and what happens? Boom. Boom. It explodes. Why does it explode? Now, this is a really interesting property about property-based tests. They are undeterministic, which is, which is really, really confusing, right? We are functional programmers. We like determinism, totalute. This is not it. That, that's the truth. So what happened? When I'm running the test in my computer, it generated random values that happened to pass. This is a true story. I did not do it just for the talk. And then when I push it to, product, to master branch, it compiled on the server and generated other values. So wait, if it runs on random values, how can I trust this? So the first thing that I did was to make the test fail consistently. So how can we do that? There is a special function in ScalaCheck that tells them, please verify that this works for a thousand values, not just the random, the, the default 10 or the default 100. And I, I, I've added this function, and then it failed consistently. What happened? You already saw it, but let's try to see it together. I'm defining a shared alert, and I'm defining an empty counters. These are going to be used in the next slide, just some values. And then this is the counter example ScalaCheck found for me. It said, if you remove from the empty counters the shared alert, the result is an empty counters. Nothing gets changed here. And then, when I add the shared alert, shared alert back, this is what we wanted to do. I'm getting a count of shared to one, right? And we thought this was going to be equal to the empty counters. And this, of course, does not. So what was the original bug, like you saw? If we decrement from the empty counters, there is nothing to decrement. We did not think about it. That's a very good bug. So, so now I'm thinking to myself, wait, maybe I've got the property backwards. Maybe if I'll add to the counters and then remove, maybe then it will work, right? So. Let's, let's, let's define the, diff the, the other property. This happens a lot, by the way. This is a real life example. You, write, you, run some pro you, you, you think of some property, you try to run it, it fails, and then you try to refine it in an iterative manner. So I thought, wait, I think if I'm going to add and remove, this should work, right? It makes sense. So I'm writing the code, I'm using the for all syntax like before, calling the functions in a reverse order, and will this work? Hard to see at this point, right? We're not compilers. Uh, we got a different bug on our hand. I really thought this was going to work. What was this bug? Skalacek told us this. If you take the empty counters and add a shared alert, you've, get, you've got the counters of shared to one. And then, if you remove the shared alert, you've got the counters of shared and zero. And what did we think this was going to be equal to? The empty counters, right? So our property does not hold. What can we do? So at this point, we've got two options. We can decide to fix it, because not all properties are written in stone. Don't forget that. We can say, this property does not hold. I'm not, I'm not trusting it. So let's remove it, keep the seven unit tests, and be happy with our life. And maybe it should work. In our specific use case, it made sense not to save the zeros. So we changed the code, and then the property holds. And now, I'm asking again. I really, really love to win, by the way. We haven't, been, we haven't formally introduced, but I love to win. This is my job. And I'm not sure at this point if we are actually winning. Are we on a path to victory? Because we are writing properties and we're finding it really hard to reason about test completeness. I really want to be sure that I'm not missing any properties here. Any more tests. I don't want to be, I think it works. I want to be 100% sure. So how can I do that? 
So that's going to be the theme of the next few slides. I think that's the theme of the talk, by the way. How to be 100% sure in the test that you write. And luckily for us, there is a way to do that. So this part of the talk is called Group for the Rescue. I'm going to be using mathematics in order to solve this problem, which is really beautiful in my, in my opinion. So a few disclaimers here. I'm sorry that it looks so scary. It's not. I'm going to require a leap of faith out of you. The jump that I'm about to do will not seem trivial at all. I'm really saying it, and it wasn't an easy jump for me, but have some faith, please. This will not work at all times, but when it will, it's going to be insane, like you're about to see. And I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit, and let's go. So what's our game plan? This is it. In mathematics, yeah, I'm talking about mathematics now, there are certain structures, and those structures have defining axioms. What is an axiom? I, if I give you a structure, you can run the axioms on it and make sure it's a valid structure. It's like test that check the validity of your structure. And luckily for us in mathematics, there are well-known structures that are documented and all their axioms are written. The best thing is that we can be 100% sure that those axioms are complete, meaning we can be 100% sure that we are not missing any more properties or tests or axioms. So what is the leap of faith that I'm about to do? This is it. If by some magical coincidence, the API that we just defined together is a known mathematical structure, and this is a magical coincidence, and let's say it's going to be a group structure, if it will be, then I can use the group axioms, run them on my API, and be 100% sure that I've run all the properties and all the tests. So let's try and do that. So I'm entering Wikipedia now. I've really done it, by the way. And I'm reading the group definition in Wikipedia, the mathematical group definition. And it says like this, a group is a set with a star operation. It means a group can combine two elements together. I'm thinking, wait, my API can do that. Okay, and a group has four axioms. Okay, I like axioms. What are they? So I'm seeing closure here. What is closure? If you take any two elements and combine them, you get a third element of the same type. I'm thinking to myself, I think I've got it, right? I'm adding, I'm adding values, I'm getting a value as a return of the same type. I think I've got closure in my API. I'm looking at associativity. I think I've got it also, right? I'm working with numbers and I'm working with addition. So I think this should work. I'm seeing an identity element, which I think I've got, to be honest. I'm not sure at this point. I think it will be, let's say, an empty counters. I think this will make sense. And I'm seeing the inverse element, which I'm not really sure what is doing at the moment. But I'm saying, OK, let's open my Ammonite REPL. That's what I love to do. And let's try to define some code. So I'm defining my group API. This is what I wrote after reading Wikipedia. I'm defining four functions here. I'm defining the add functions. We take two values of type A and return a resulting value of the same type. I'm defining the remove function, which does exactly the opposite. I've, I've defined the inverse function, which at this point I'm not really sure what it does, but I've written it in any case. And I'm defining the identity element function, which returns the identity value. Okay, so this is where I want to be. Why? Because I want the group axioms. And this is where I'm currently at. I've got an API. I've got two functions in my API. And I'm trying to see how I can go from one to the other. So the first issue that I noticed is that I've got two type parameters. I've got a counters type and I've got an alert type. If I can remove one of them, maybe I can be closer to the group API. The group API has a single type parameter. Great. So I'm thinking long and hard on the types here. And then I come to the conclusion that I think I can get rid 
of the alert data type, right? I, my business should be about counting. Alerts have no business here. And how can I remove the alert data type? I'm thinking, wait, if there is a function from an alert to counters, then I'm done, right? I can safely remove the alert type, put counters instead, and be done with it. And when I think of functions like this, I like to take sample values and make sure, and try to see if it works. So I'm looking at, let's say, the active alert, the alert that sees, sits at the active folder. And I'm thinking, what will be the equivalent counter's value? I'm thinking, wait, the count of active to one sounds like a reasonable result here. And when I think that, I'm sure that I can write this property, write this function, sorry. And then great, so if I, if I can write this function, it's a one-liner, by the way, I'm not going to show it to you because it doesn't really matter. It's on GitHub, don't worry. I can remove the alert type, right? So my API at the moment has only one type, the counters type. Great, now what do I do? Let's talk about the identity element, right? I need to add it somehow. So I'm just writing def identity returns the value of counters. I'm thinking I'm going to return an empty counters here, an empty map. I think this makes sense. The last function that we need, ah, sorry about that. Now, if we look at our API, we are seeing only one type in all of our functions. What can we do now? We can push the type to the trait level. We can make the trait polymorphic. So that's what we do next. We are making our API polymorphic. Look here. One type, counters everywhere. Here, only A's. It's the same thing, just parameterized. And then we're getting there. We are missing only a single function, function at this point. We are missing the inverse function. So let's write it and see how our API looks like. So if we look closely, when we have an inverse and an add function, we can say, Wait, I think I can define the remove using both of them. I think the inverse should work here. It makes sense. So if you think about it, in, you can implement the remove using combining the current with an inverse of the remove. So the inverse does make sense here. And when I look at this API, remember, we started with two functions, counters and alert. We've got until this part. I'm seeing that I think I'm done. I think I can implement a group of, of this trait and I can fill, fill in everything. I think this API makes sense. So I go and do that, right? I go and implement an instance of a group of my type, the counters type, and write the code. I think it's three lines, by the way. Um, then I go and write the axioms, right? There are known axioms in Wikipedia. I go and write them. But luckily for us, we don't need to do that. Luckily for us, our favorite functional library called CATS has done it for us. Some very smart people have sat down and written all the implementation for us. So we don't really have to do that. We don't really have to do and implement those types and those tests and those axioms. Everything is available in CATS. So I'm defining a group of counters using CATS types. It doesn't really matter how the implementation looks like. It's a beautiful three, line, three lines of code. I will post it later on my Twitter. You, you're welcome to check it out, but that's, that's not the, 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 the purpose of this talk. What we are looking for is the test, remember? So a lot of imports here. The, the most interesting ones are the group test. This is the test, test class in CATS that has all the axioms of group defined in it. We don't really have to do that ourselves. So I'm using the group test case, test case class, and I'm using the discipline trait. The discipline trait allows us to use the check all function. It's an equivalent syntax of the for all function we've seen before, but just in another library. And then I'm saying, please run the group tests on my counters type. Look at the single line of testing code here. Run the group test on my counters type, on my group of counters, 
and make sure the group axioms are working. Single line of test in code. And then, what do I do? I'm running the test, right? Boom. I've got 13 green properties here. I was able to come up, and this is just me, to be honest, of three. I've missed give or take eight or nine. So 13 green properties, boom, right off the bat. We've written a single property. And the most basic question, are we sure at this point that we are not missing any more properties? The answer is yes. This is victory. Finally, we have won. Um, and now, what can we say to all those unit tests that we wrote in the beginning of the talk? Are they needed anymore? No. We can finally kill them, right? I hate those unit tests. <laughs> so this is it. We won. Let's summarize. We've talked today about the missing unit test problem. We are writing unit tests and we are writing concrete values. Every time we do that, we are missing unit tests. And we don't want to do that anymore. It's really frustrating. Let's solve the problem. How can we do that? So property-based tests allows us to do just that. How? by defining generators, which allows us to iterate over an infinite amount of values, and properties, which are just assertions that we run on those values. Then we talked about the missing properties problem. We've tried to write one property, two properties. We tried to refine them. It was a really long and hard process. And then, when we wanted to go for the victory, for the icing on the cake, we went for math to the rescue. It's a really beautiful thing, in my opinion. My takeaways from this talk, don't just look at the code today and say, this is nice. Try this at home. It's so much fun. I've never enjoyed writing unit tests like I've, I've had it here. It's so much fun. The discussions are really interesting. And I'm really beginning to understand my functions better. It's really, really simple to think of your function as just edge cases. I'm entering a specific value and something comes out in the end. But if you try to reason about all of the values, it's much more difficult and much more joyful when you do that. The payoff is huge and it's really, really fun. So go check it out. Thank you very much. Here is a GitHub to all of the code that you've seen today and a blog post that explains everything and more. And that's it. Thank you. Talk to me if you have questions. Otherwise, we've got a 10 minute, 15 minute recess, pizza, and then another talk by Itama. Yes, please. Uh, what's the performance hit when you're using the property based tests? How, how worse is it? Great question. Uh, the reality is that the generators are the difficult part if they are generated for you. I did not talk about this in this talk. Uh, but the honest is that you have to keep it in mind and optimize it while you're writing them. It gives you a huge impact while you're writing the code, and then you commit it with a few iterations. I did not go over that in, the, in this talk, but a good question. Yes? How many structure, structures did you go before arriving in the group? Five. Five. something small. Five. Five. Yeah. Good question. What makes you, make you go up to group? A Rob Norris talk, to be honest. He's one of my favorite functional programmers. I encourage you to go and check him out. He talked about group one of these days. I talked with some guy at work. And then we came up with this solution. It really hit me. It's a really leap of faith that I did, by the way. Thank you for the question. So it's, it, it sounds like really good when you have an API which you can think of as a closed algebraic structure where you can, let's say, add user, remove user. But what happens if uh, we have, for example, an API which is immutable? When you post a document, then if it already exists, we create a new version of it. So it feels like it's not the same structure. How can I test it with these tools? So I did not fully understand your question, to be super honest. It's I would. A, a associative case. Ah, if, it, if you don't have associativity? Yeah. Not all structures are born associative, it's okay. But I think it's a great question. I would be happy to elaborate in person. I think I've tried to show examples of it. Like we had two or three properties committed and we've really added more until we found the structure. There aren't so many hidden structures in your code. Um, but let's talk face to face. I would be happy to talk about it. Any more? Yes, last one. Uh, 
Um, what do you think about the, the notion of you know, the traditional scala test uh, approach when you see a lot of tests that actually describes the behavior of your API or your service? Um, in this way, when a new developer comes you know, to the team, so we can actually see the contract of your API, the contract of, of your program. And in this way, I can only see like a single line of code which describes maybe vaguely a single behavior. And maybe you know I wouldn't be able to, to understand or to grasp what does the, the application should do. Great question. Face to face, let's continue. That's a really great question. I've got a lot to say. I'm not going to bore everyone. The honest, the, the bottom line, the TLDR, uh, it's really a matter of personal choice. If you're working in a more functional way and everybody in the team knows that, I think this is really, really nice and readable and fun. If not, I would argue against it. So it really depends. Thank you very much.